with that song, I'll close for Ancient Faith Radio. This is Dr. Albert Rossi. Dr. Rossi is the author of the Ancient Faith Publishing book, Becoming a Healing Presence, available at store.ancientfaith.com. This has been a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. Linking the ancient Christian faith with modern technology. You're listening to Internet-based Ancient Faith Radio. It's time now for Stewardship Calling with your host, Bill Marianis. Bill is a stewardship evangelist whose stewardship calling ministry is focused on helping people, parishes, and Christian organizations discover and live their stewardship callings and embrace true stewardship and generosity so that they may have a good account before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. Here's Bill. I don't feel so good. I think I'm sick. I'm not exactly sure what's wrong, but I can tell something isn't right. I'm a little worried, but where do I go to find out and figure out what's wrong with me and how to fix it? I'm also concerned about my financial situation. I mean, inflation is rampant. My expenses have gone up faster than income, and the stock market is so volatile. I, I wonder if, if, if we'll have enough money for what we need and to retire comfortably. Where can I go to figure out what my situation is, and what can they do to help me? And our church is suffering. It has so many needs and challenges. Some of these problems seem to have been around for a while, although I think they've gotten worse in the last few years. And Frankly, I'm not sure where to start or, or, or what to do. I, I, to be honest, I'm not even sure we even know what the issues are that we're facing, let alone what to do about them. We've all heard people say these things at various times. The, the good news is that doctors know how the, the tests that they have to administer to assess and remediate our personal health, and financial planners know how to assess and remediate our financial health. However, the bad news is that our Orthodox Christian parishes have, have lacked similar empirical and validated tools to help them. Our churches and parishioners are suffering. They've, they've been suffering for many years, perhaps even decades. Attendance is suffering. Volunteerism is suffering. Youth engagement is suffering. Giving is suffering. Participation in sacraments and religious educational programs are suffering. Stewardship and engagement in ministries are suffering. And on and on we go. All of the above and more have now been empirically measured. These aren't merely opinions. They are regrettably verified facts. And maybe your parish isn't experiencing all of the above, but across the landscape of the Orthodox Christian churches in America, what I call the American orthosphere, the, the above issues and many more are veritable pandemics. There's a God-fearing Orthodox priest who confessed the following, Every day I look out, I see my parish dying right before my very eyes, and I don't know what to do about it. And before anyone criticizes the, this righteous and loving man of God, he isn't alone. In, in, in countless discussions that I've had with clergy of all ranks, jurisdictions, and geographies, I hear some version of the same thing over and over again, uh, although in, in slightly different words. Now, look, God bless them for their honest confessions. They deserve praise for their integrity. And in this two-part Stewardship Calling Live program on July 31st and August 3rd, 2022, we are absolutely not sitting in judgment of anyone. In fact, these programs are not about sitting around anymore. These programs are, are a wake-up call and, and the offering of a solution to assess and perhaps address many of the most significant parish needs and issues. Now, Holy Scripture tells us that it's critical to undertake such self-assessments. We need to look no further than 2 Corinthians 13, 5, where we hear, and I quote, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test, end quote. And in Acts 14, 15, we hear, quote, men, why are you doing these things, end quote. 
And even in Romans 12, 2, we hear, quote, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will, end quote. My brothers and sisters, it's time to do just that. So welcome, brothers and sisters, to Stewardship Calling in the fifth Sunday series on Ancient Faith Radio. This is Bill Marianas from StewardshipCalling.com and Orthodox Ministry Services, coming to you live from the shores of beautiful Lake Lanier in Gainesville, Georgia, just north of Atlanta. I have a simple premise that you have been called by your Creator to a personal calling, a reason to your life and a reason for your life, something you need to do with all of the gifts over which God has made you a steward. It's what I call your stewardship calling. And St. Paul repeatedly makes it crystal clear over and over again in his preaching. In fact, in, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, he clearly states, quote, I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, end quote. Now, to 2017 by day, I was blessed to be a partner in two great international law firms of over 1,100 lawyers each, where I served in management, including as managing partner of our Atlanta office and practice in the area of mergers and acquisitions and corporate law. But my why, my personal calling is to be a stewardship calling evangelist. I'm here to help people in parishes discover and live their stewardship callings so that they may have a good account before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. As we all endeavor to follow Christ's great commandment to love one another, his great charge to serve one another, and his great commission to make disciples of all nations. Welcome to that journey. Now, this program and a lot of other helpful tools and information about effective churches and stewardship and church strategic planning, etc., can be found at my always free website, stewardshipcalling.com, and you can always reach me at bill at stewardshipcalling.com. And to all of our listeners tonight, whether you're listening to us live on the Ancient Faith Radio platform or on YouTube or on any other uh, social media outlets that we're broadcasting live on, we welcome your calls at one eight five five af radio That's one 237 2346 When we look at the real data, we discover that our churches are all suffering, to, to one degree or another, of multiple root cause issues that, that, that can form comorbidities. And the inevitable result of these problems is a form of illness, and perhaps worse, in, in some cases, even death, if there's no intervention. Sometimes a quick consequence and sometimes a slow and long descent into the abyss. But make no mistake about it. If you didn't seek to cure what ails you, well, the results will generally not be all that pleasant. In my full-time volunteer work of helping people in parishes discover and live their stewardship callings, not a week goes by without hearing a priest, a layperson, and or a hierarch express their concern that their parishes are struggling. As the very impactful pastor Rick Warren once famously said, Leaders of a church will either be risk takers, caretakers, or undertakers. So, which are you? Almost 2,000 years after our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ started our church, it's now our turn on the watch. If anything goes well at your parish, you should celebrate it. But if anything isn't going perfectly, or, or even well, well, then you own that issue. And since it's your turn at the helm, what happens on your watch is your legacy, and what you will one day need to explain when you stand before the awesome judgment seat of Christ, as we're promised in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Now, I wanted to start by reviewing for you, as I always like to do at the beginning of every program, just a few highlights of the verified and empirical data of our situation. And you, you can consider this high-level diagnosis the kind of thing your doctor might prepare after she takes all your vital signs. I'm going to share only five highlights of the reams of such reliable data points that we've gathered. And all of this data was pre-COVID. I mean, I honestly fear that once we have reliable post-COVID data, unfortunately, I think many of these results could be even worse. Fact number one, 47% of adults who were raised in the Orthodox Christian Church have left the church, according to the Pew Research Center. Let that soak in for a second. Even before COVID, we had already lost almost half of the cradle Orthodox Christians that were born into the church. And this alone should be a red alert wake-up call. But fact number two makes it worse. In fact number two, we find out that, that, that not only have we lost half of our adults, we can kiss our youth goodbye. As of 2019, according to the well-respected Barna Research Group, 64% of young adults with a Christian background drop out of church 
during their 20s. And what's even worse is that this 64% church dropout rate is actually five percentage points worse than it was just a few years earlier. I mean, this means that this massive loss of youth is getting much worse over time. And again, all of this data is pre-COVID. Fact number three, around 39% of millennials, and the millennials are the ones that were born between 1981 and 1996, 39% of those millennials are now nuns, N-O-N-E-S, according to the well-respected Public Religion Research Institute. These almost 40% of U.S. Christian youth no longer claim any religious affiliation. My brothers and sisters, they aren't just taking a break from the religions of their youth as maybe some of us did when we went off to college. This almost 40% of our beloved millennial Christians are actually repudiating and totally leaving the religions of their youth. And again, the trend lines are tragically going in the wrong direction because in, in just the six years from the prior Pew Forum on Religious Public Life Study, the departure rate of young adults is five percentage points worse. So do the math. If we continue to lose just 1% a year, even though a lot of us fear that it's going to be much worse in the post-COVID aftermath, we could be at a total loss within a few short decades, less than the span of an average person's life. This is our problem to address now because the negative trends are actually accelerating. Fact number four, within the American Orthodox churches, on average, only 26% of Orthodox parishioners regularly attend church on Sunday. This according to a a pre-COVID study that was sponsored by the Assembly of Canonical Orthodox Bishops. And think about this, of the half of our Orthodox cradle Orthodox that we haven't lost, plus all of the wonderful converts we've gained, Only about one in four regularly attend church on Sunday. So there are already 75% of those who still consider themselves Orthodox Christians who are not being reached on a typical Sunday. And in fact, number five, I'll, I'll present tonight is only one measure of how effective our Sunday services are in the American orthosphere. The question asked was, other than during the divine liturgy, what percentage of the time during the, excuse me, other than during the homily, What percentage of the time during the divine liturgy is your mind wandering? And and maybe your mind's wandering because your kid is crying or there's, you're distracted because some other kids are crying or, or an adult is talking or, or maybe something big is going on in your life, like a, a health problem or financial issue or something at work, or maybe even an addiction. And maybe it's because over there you see Maria or Joe, and you remember that you want to talk to them about something. A statistically significant sampling of Orthodox parishioners who are actual church attenders honestly admitted that they are distracted about 75% of the time during the divine liturgy. So let's take a second and let all this empirical data soak in. Ask yourself, if you knew or suspected these facts before tonight, it's important because this is our interim report card in case the Lord were to send someone down to assess how we're doing with his church under our watch. We've lost half of our cradle Orthodox adults. We're losing 60% of our kids when they live our homes. Of all the cradle Orthodox we kept plus all of our converts, only about 25% are regularly attending church on Sunday. And when they do, they aren't really there because their minds are wandering about 75% of the time. Look, I I could go on shocking you into awareness with more empirical data, but anyone who is objective and who cares about Christ Church would hear a 20-alarm fire right about now, well well above the maximum 10-alarm fire. Anyone else feeling as anxious as I do? I mean, if this was the data from your business, you'd be out of business soon, as it's clearly unsustainable. And yet this is exactly what's happening across the American Orthodox Christian churches. Now, your, your parish might be better or worse in one or more of these areas, but anomalies do not negate the norms. My brothers and sisters, we've been in crisis for quite some time, and frankly, all of this predates the COVID pandemic. Now, before you think I'm chicken little or that these, that these current many decades-long problems are unique, let me assure you, they are not. History tells us of some important points of inflection for our churches, points in time when faithful Christians stood together and with a unified voice fought the adversities of their day. They they bravely committed that Christ Church would not decline under their watch and would instead grow. 
Jay Warner Wallace is a best-selling author, and he serves as a, a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. And he wrote an inspiring historical perspective called Lessons for Today's Church from the Life of the Early Church. And in it, he wrote, and I quote, the early Christians didn't attend church, they were the church. An active, engaged body of believers equipped to change the world. The first Christians were revolutionaries. The group they formed was, in many ways, very different from what we know as the church today. According to the book of Acts, they met in their homes and devoted themselves to God's word. As a result, these early Christians brought about the most amazing and powerful transformation the world has ever known, end quote. Perhaps all of the headwinds that we face, it, it, it may be time for us to consider ourselves revolutionaries again, unapologetic revolutionaries for Christ and what he taught us, unafraid to stand up and say we are followers of Jesus Christ and willing to take all of the slings and arrows and criticisms that the evil one can, can throw at us. Not just people occasionally going to church and not paying attention, but people who are the very personification of Christ's church, 24 by 7 by 365. In other words, if you were put on trial and accused of being a Christian, you would be found guilty as charged. But ask yourself, if your parish ceased to exist tomorrow, would anyone in your community even notice, other than they, they might miss your ethnic food sales? If not, what are you going to do about it? Because you can do something. The, the acknowledged father of the quality movement and a great mind of his time was W. Edwards Deming, and he's a distinguished professor at both Columbia and NYU. And my, fa my favorite Deming quote, a little bit off subject, my favorite Deming quote was when he said, quote, in God we trust, all others bring data, end quote. But, but, but really to the point of what we're talking about tonight, among Dr. Deming's amazing contributions was the following conclusions that he reached from a vast amount of research that he did during his career. And here's what he said, quote, anytime the majority of people behave a particular way, the majority of the time, the people are not the problem. The problem is inherent in the system. As a leader, you own responsibility for the system. Although a particular person can certainly be a big problem, if you find yourself blaming the people, you should look again, end quote. All right. So some of you are saying, enough of the gloom and doom, Marianas, we get it. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Well, no problem can be solved until it's first properly diagnosed. And this brings us back to my opening. Doctors know the tests to run to diagnose our health issues, but we've lacked the empirically validated tests to assess our parish health. But no more. Now, before we discuss the solution in the form of the effective parish assessment that we'll be talking about tonight, and on this part two program on Wednesday, it's important that let, let's take a, a moment to discuss how we got here. How do we figure out what these right questions were to ask? Now, if you're a regular listener to my Stewardship Calling program here on Ancient Faith Radio, you've probably heard me prattle on endlessly about how over the last 20 years or so of traveling about 375,000 miles, I've actually stopped keeping track uh, throughout the U.S., working with well over 500 Orthodox parishes of, of literally almost every Orthodox jurisdiction. And, and by the grace of God, being blessed to help work on strategic plans covering 26% of Orthodox Christians, as well as financial stewardship analysis for over 275 Orthodox parishes, you, 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 you can sit there and say, oh, well, that's impressive, but shouldn't be. It, it just means I'm old and I've been doing this for a long time. But by the grace of God, my meager efforts have been substantially magnified and expanded by the work of my three Orthodox Ministry Services colleagues who you're going to hear from tonight and on the August 3rd program. Brothers Mitch Owens, Steve Tibbs, and Nick Chakos add their own substantial expertise from their own decades of work with businesses and nonprofits and Orthodox churches. I mean, honestly, we haven't calculated, but we're talking about well over 75 combined years of actively toiling in Christ's Orthodox Church mission field, dealing with the unique and sometimes non-unique issues that face Christ's church. When you combine the hand-on expertise of the OMS church team, it's, it's frankly a little bit unprecedented in the American orthosphere. 
But see, we didn't stop there. We reviewed and compared our own substantial research with that from some of the best organizations working kind of in the broader Christian mission field, some of the well-established and, and best, organ, uh, best in class organizations like the Pew Research Center and the Gallup Organization and Barna Research and Public Religion Research Institute, the, the National Study of Youth Religion, even the, the, the Science of Generosity Studies and a lot more. And we poured over amazing data from the extensive research that Gallup has been conducting for well over 70 years that was kind of summarized in the seminal work, Growing and Engaged Church, and many of the other Pew and Barna studies. And our goal, after all these efforts, was to, as objectively as possible, discern the best empirical data and provable truths that were applicable to Orthodox Christian parishes. So by comparing this independent research with the extensive and statistically significant research OMS team members have compiled from their own extensive research, we could analyze the root cause issues our Orthodox parishes are facing and then build validated models of inquiry to assess parishes. And along our journey, we were joined by the amazing Dr. Scott Mondor, another Orthodox Christian who brings with him decades of empirical research skills that he's using to help Christ Church by helping create the most useful and reliable parish tools. And the incredibly talented Louis Lambrew of Lambrew Marketing was instrumental in setting up the Effective Parish Assessment website and creating the other informational materials that you'll find there and we're going to talk about tonight. And, and from all of the work for over 75 years, which became really intense in the last two and a half years, was born the effective parish assessment that we're going to discuss tonight and on August 3rd. You see, our extensive research discovered some of the most critical root cause issues with which our churches are struggling. And when we analyzed them and carefully dug in deeply, as it turned out, we discovered that there were 30 building blocks that collectively hold up six pillars that a church must optimize to excellence in order to be the most healthy and effective it can be. And it's these six pillars and these 30 building blocks that we're going to explore in a little bit more detail tonight and on the August 3rd Stewardship Calling Program right here on Ancient Faith Radio to give you visibility into what we need to do to make the healthiest and strongest Orthodox Christian churches in our Jerusalem, the United States. So first, please allow me to clarify some terms that we're going to be using tonight and on August 3rd. When, when we talk about the six pillars of an effective church, this, this, is, this was formed as a result of looking at the data and our substantial experience of six very critical areas that have to be optimized to excellence in the most effective and healthy parish. And supporting those six pillars are the 30 building blocks in effective church. Again, this is what the data and substantial experience told us were 30 individual things that also have to be optimized to excellence in order to support those six effective pillars in the most effective churches. Now, how do you go about assessing this? Well, we created a two-part assessment tool. The EPA-1, Effective Parish Assessment 1, evaluates your parish's performance on the six pillars of an effective parish. And then we created six individual EPA-2s, Effective Parish Assessments 2, one for each of the six pillars. And those EPA-2s evaluate a parish's uh, building blocks that support that pillar. Now, a lot of this seems a little bit obtuse from now, and hopefully as we go through this, it'll be a, lot, a little bit clearer. But Orthodox Ministry Services, what we call OMS, is committed to eventually making these essential assessment tools of EPA 1 of the six pillars and EPA 2 of the 30 building blocks available to all Orthodox Christian churches. Yeah, you heard me right. Our gratefulness to a most gracious God leads us to do what we can to help all of his churches become force multipliers of Christianity. So get a pencil out and write this website down, www.effectiveparish.org. That's effectiveparish.org. The effectiveparish.org website homepage gives you a high-level description of the Effective Parish Assessment. And the second page is devoted to the Orthodox Effective Parish Assessment tool. Now, this is a page where all Orthodox parishes, regardless of jurisdiction, can read about what the EPA entails once we make it available. And if you're interested, there's a form where you can submit your parish information to info at effectiveparish.org. That's info at effectiveparish.org. Because our goal is to make effectiveparish.org a gateway 
to allow you to learn more about the six pillars and the EPA-1 and the 30 building blocks of the EPA-2. And more importantly, once we finally release the EPA-1 and EPA-2 on the special new platform that we're designing for mass availability, if you register, we will let you know when you can access both the EPA-1 and EPA-2 for free from EffectiveParish.org. Th these tools aren't released yet because we're finalizing a special new delivery platform for mass access. And that's why we're asking parishes to register so that we can notify you when it's available. And don't worry, OMS will absolutely and unequivocally not use your email for anything, anything else, but to communicate with you about the effective parish assessment process and tools. We're doing this work to freely help you for God's greater glory and not for any pay practice or praise. But there's a third page of the EffectiveParish.org website called the GOA EPAP. Due to the generosity of Leadership 100 and with the support of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese Department of Stewardship, OMS is able to actually go further for a few selected cohort GOA parishes. Through this special Leadership 100 program, OMS established the GOA Effective Parish Assessment Program that will not only provide the EPA 1 and EPA 2, but also an invaluable preliminary parish improvement plan. Don't you just love acronyms? The PPIP, right? So the PPIP, the Preliminary Parish Improvement Plan, is, is an actual roadmap that takes the results of the EPA 1 assessment of the six pillars and the EPA 2 assessment of the 30 building blocks at your parish, color codes them so that you can see in a red, yellow, green format where the green means that things in your parish are in good shape in these categories, the yellow means things are cautionary, you need to take a look at them. And then the red areas are the areas in your parish needs to devote significant urgent attention to either that pillar or that building block. And in addition to the parish preliminary improvement plan, the GOA parishes that are chosen to participate in the uh, Special Leadership 100 GOA and OMS cohort program will also receive several consultative sessions with true subject matter experts at OMS that you're frankly going to hear from in the next two programs to help custom tailor solutions for those cohort parishes to actually address the biggest needs. Now, because this is such an extra effort with the, the current support of Leadership 100, OMS is only able to provide this more comprehensive EPA program at this time to approximately the first 18 to 20 GOA parishes that meet the select, uh, selection criteria. What we're, what we're looking for are innovator and early adopter GOA parishes with experienced clergy and lay leadership that are committed to this kind of helpful self-assessment and evaluation and then willing to work on implementing solutions. So if you're a GOA parish and interested in being considered for the GOA cohort effective parish program, there is a form on that third GOA EPAP page that you can submit your information to cohort parish at EffectiveParish.org. Again, it's a lot easier when you take a look at the website, it'll be clear. So when are we going to release the Effective Parish assessments to everyone? Well, kind of as I mentioned before, we're in the final stages of testing a new mass delivery platform vehicle for the Effective Parish Assessments 1 and 2. And assuming everything goes well in our testing, our goal is to release the EPA sometime after the beginning of the new ecclesiastical year in September. Now, during the month of August, we're going to work closely to finalize that mass delivery platform and work to interview and select the at least 18 GOA cohort parishes to participate in that special Leadership 100 GOA and OMS program. But it's our dream that once the GOA cohort effective program is completed and assessed, with some additional financial support to expand the resources, that we want to be able to broaden the EPA program many, many more parishes and not only have complete EPA 1 and EPA 2 of your pillars and your building blocks, but, but, but go through the full parish improvement process and the consultative session. So if there's any person or foundation or group out there that wants to help support extending the effective parish assessment program that includes these other tools, please let us know at info at effectiveparish.org. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So again, after the program tonight, we want you to go to effectiveparish.org and check out the Orthodox EPA page. And if you wish to receive the free Effective Parish Assessment Tool, send us a message at info at effectiveparish.org. That's info at effectiveparish.org. And for the GOA parishes applying for the Special Leadership 100 program, you'll do so at cohort parish at effectiveparish.org. But again, that's all plain and clear when you just go to the effectiveparish.org website.
Now, here's what we're going to do for the rest of this program and the part two on August 3rd. Tonight, we are going to explore with my Orthodox Ministry Services colleagues the first three pillars and the first 15 building blocks of an effective parish. And we will discuss the remaining three pillars and the remaining 15 building blocks just coming up on Wednesday, August 3rd, for the first Wednesday program here. Now, tonight's focus are going to focus on the first three pillars of the effective and healthy church. Those pillars are vision and planning, leadership and teams, stewardship and generosity. And you hold directly from the members of the OMS team who are working on those specific pillars and building blocks. Now, unfortunately for y'all, two of these three areas tonight are areas in which I'm, I'm very actively engaged. So you're going to hear more from me uh, tonight than you certainly will on the Wednesday program when it'll be more of my colleagues speaking. But before I take a short break, I wanted to briefly introduce or actually reintroduce my guests and Orthodox Ministry Services colleagues, Mitch Owens, Steve Tibbs, and Nick Chakos, most of whom have been guests already on Stewardship Calling. So let's start with Dr. Mitch Owen. So in addition to his work with Orthodox Ministry Services, Dr. Mitch Owen is the founder and chief operating officer of Mitchin Incorporated, which is an innovative training and organizational development company. Now, pre, prior to that, Mitch served as the Deputy Director for Performance and Organization Development with the North Carolina Department of Public Safety and as the Director of the Personal and Organizational Development at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. Dr. Owen is the creator of the elusive leadership model for high-performance teams and the Mitchin Organization Strategic Positioning System. And you're going to hear a little bit about that because they've been interwoven in what we're talking about today. Mitch also serves as a coach for over 25 executives, doctors, clergy, nurses, and public health professionals. He was a leader in the metropolis of Atlanta strategic planning goals that worked on developing a servant leadership program, obviously with his background, and also a parish strategic planning process. Mitch completed his doctorate of education at North Carolina State University in adult education and development, focusing his research on technology adoption and psychology. Mitch also currently serves as a member of the Metropolis Council, the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of Atlanta. My second colleague you're going to hear from tonight, another no stranger to this program, is Steve Tibbs. Steve led the implementation of the strategic plan for the Metropolis of San Francisco. And in addition to his work with Orthodox Ministry Services, Steve is the CEO of an organizational consultancy that he founded in 2003. But prior to that, Steve was the global practice leader for Lee Hecht Harrison's leadership consulting practice. And before that, he was a partner in Hydric at Struggles leadership consulting practice, specializing in executive coaching and assessments. Steve also was with Accenture for nearly 10 years, where he was a partner in their human performance and change management practice and also served as the global managing partner for their enterprise portal practice. When, when Steve was at Accenture, he was a practice leader for engagements that was focused on working on workforce transformation and transitions, and in addition to large-scale outsourcing deals. And Steve holds a bachelor's degree in health education from California State University, Long Beach, and a master's degree in human resource management from the University of Redlands. Our third colleague, who could not be with us tonight, but will be featured uh, in depth in the program on Wednesday, is Nick Chakos. And Nick's an experienced nonprofit leader that's currently serving as the CEO of Orthodox Ministry Services. But prior to that, he served as the Executive Director of Focus North America and as a Director of Development and U.S. Program Director of IOCC, where he served for 13 years. He's also the co-founder of the healthcare analytics company, Primer. Nick is an adjunct professor of organizational development and leadership at the University of Pittsburgh's Graduate School and has trained over 250 nonprofit organizations in leadership development, fundraising, and organizational infrastructure and strategic planning. He's a graduate of the Lilly School of Philanthropy at Indiana University, in addition to holding a BA from Washington Jefferson College and a Master's of Nonprofit Administration from the University of Notre Dame with honors. Now, again, as I said, due to unavoidable conflict, Nick's not going to be available to join us tonight, and that's okay. We've, we've arranged this so that the three areas in which he is more actively engaged will be on the Wednesday program. And finally, as to me, well, 
Look, if you're a regular listen to these stewardship calling programs right here on Ancient Faith Radio, you you know my story. I'm I'm just a recovering simple country lawyer who spent about 36 years as a partner in in leadership in two global law firms of 1,100 lawyers each. But before the Lord called me not to retire, but instead refire and work full time for free in my stewardship calling in OMS Ministries. I was blessed to uh, earn a BA in psychology from Northwestern University, uh, an MBA from Emory University's Gazueta Graduate School of Business Administration, a Juris Doctorate from Emory University's uh, School of Law, and I'm currently working on a doctorate in strategic leadership with a concentration in servant leadership at Regent University. So that's the OMS Church team, and, and the team for tonight and part two of the program on August 3rd is we're going to explore in depth the six pillars and 30 building blocks of an effective and healthy parish and how you can assess where your parish is on each of those pillars and those building blocks through the effective parish assessment tool. So we're going to take a short break right now. When I come back, my colleagues and I will begin to explore the Orthodox Ministry Services Effective Parish Assessment Program. We'll be right back. Bill will be right back, but the lines are open if you want to ask a question or offer your thoughts. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Reading through the entire Bible in just one year. To an average person in today's busy world, it seems like a daunting challenge. But in the Orthodox Daily Scriptures podcast, Father Alexis Kouri makes it a journey that is not only rewarding, but simple and accessible as well. They buried their bones under the oak tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. So Saul died for his lawlessness, which he committed against the Lord according to the word of the Lord, because he did not keep it, and because Saul sought counsel of a wizard, and Samuel the prophet answered him. So he slew him and turned the kingdom over to David. To find this podcast and others like it, you can go to ancientfaith.com. Stewardship Calling is back, and we are ready for your call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Here again is Bill Marianis. So welcome back to Stewardship Calling in our fifth Sunday program where we're discussing the effective parish assessment program and, and how your parish could receive a valuable and free service with my colleagues at Orthodox Ministry Services. Again, remember, we we welcome your calls and your questions at one eight five five af radio That's one 237 2346 now, before we get started with the first pillar of operational excellence, please remember to check out the EffectiveParish.org website. And if you're an Orthodox parish with clergy and lay leadership committed to operational excellence and interested in being able to receive the benefit of the free Effective Parish program, you can register at info at EffectiveParish.org. That's info at EffectiveParish.org. And during the break, believe it or not, I got a text message. We already have had three people sign up. So thank you all for listening and for participating. Um, we're going to put you on a distribution list, and we will let you know once the Effective Parish assessment is available for use along with instructions. But if you go to EffectiveParish.org uh, uh, and you go to the Orthodox EPA page, you'll see three documents that you can download that describe this in greater detail so that you can figure out whether your parish is interested. And of course, if you're one of the GOA parishes that's willing to participate in the Leadership 100 expanded program, you can go to the GOA EPAP page that there on EffectiveParish.org and register at Cohort Parish at EffectiveParish.org. So we're going to begin with our first operational pillar of effectiveness, and it is called vision and planning. Now, if you were listening to our respective bios, you, you've heard that that all of us have substantial experience with strategic planning. But to get us started, my colleague Mitch Owen and I are going to get the ball rolling and get some additional uh, support from Steve, who also does a lot of strategic planning. So the question that we want to explore for all of our listeners are, why are these pillars and building blocks the most critical root cause definers of parish health and excellence? And to answer that for the first pillar of vision and planning, We'd be remiss if we didn't start with the scriptural foundations from Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people will perish. 
And look, you instinctively knew this because you'd never go to the airport and buy a plane ticket to somewhere. You always have a destination in mind. And yet in parish after parish, I find that there's often no specific vision that they're pursuing over the next three or so years. Also, they're rarely defined strategic goals that will allow them to achieve a vision of improvement or change of direction. And regrettably, in far too many parishes, there's no plan of any kind at all other than just dealing with the constant pressure of never-ending day-to-day issues. It's what I call the, the tyranny of the urgent. And often, there is some form of a plan, but it's neither strategic nor long-term. See, many of the parish programs we see are short-term and just focused on some tactics that they need to do in a particular immediate task to be sure annual operating and tactical plans are important. Don't get me wrong. They are. But tonight, what we're really going to discuss is, is the, a little bit about the short-term tactical plans, but in the context of the vision and the overall planning that the most effective parishes need to do. So a critical, I would say, an indeed, an essential initial pillar of a healthy and effective parish is a clear consensus vision that is shared by the parish as a whole, along with a strategic plan or similar vehicle, by whatever name you choose to call it, that drives the parish forward intentionally and methodically toward a specific destination that addresses its most significant and strategic needs. And as the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King once famously said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to to keep moving forward. So before I ask my my colleague, Dr. Mitch Owen here, who's been doing strategic planning, he calls it strategic positioning with major colleges and universities, I believe we have a caller on the line. So Greg from San Antonio, are you with us? Uh, Yes, Bill. How are you this evening? Thank God I'm doing great, partner. How are you? Uh, Just marvelous. Thank you for what you're doing and your team. And uh, I just wanted to share with you, we probably have uh, five people on the call at least this evening, and we're one of those three that have already signed up. And I'll be okay. quiet, and I will listen to the six, uh, the the uh, the effective uh, parish model. So I just want to say thank you for what you're doing. Well, God bless you, Greg, and God bless your people from your community. And yes, indeed, I when I got the message across from Brother Louis Lambro, he said that y'all were one of the first ones to sign up. So that's awesome, and we we look forward to working with you. And so I think Father Thomas may even be out there listening as well this evening. So how's that? Oh, well, that's that'd be great. I, I look forward to talking to him. It's been so long since since we've had a chance to chat. He's he's one of my favorites. So if he if he is listening, uh, you know how much I love you. And if if he's not listening, I hope you listen to the podcast version of this when we release it. But thank y'all very much. We will be in touch with you, partner. Go ahead. Thank you much. Enjoy the evening. Enjoy the call. Okay. Bye. All right. So, Mitch, you've been at this for a very, very long time. Why don't you share with the listeners why it is so critically important, this whole pillar of vision and planning as you see it? Thank you, Bill. It's great to be with everybody tonight. Um, uh, you know, you did a great job kind of framing it. Um, I, I might frame it similarly, but uh, use my own kind of analogies. You know, I often think of, um, we just had the Tour de France and we have all these bicyclers on teams. If those teams don't have a destination in mind and a plan for how they're getting there, they don't have a vision for how they're going to handle the race, they lose. And we certainly don't want parishes to lose. And, and in my mind, uh, visioning and planning is about that consensus shared vision about what's important to our community, what's important for us to work together toward, What goals do we need to have? And if you don't have that, you're just going to have a lot of um, a lot of things that happen that don't ever collectively collectively come together toward a common goal and and success. So uh, it's it's probably the most important thing a community can do is getting everybody on the same page with the same vision, not just in the short run, as Bill says, but in the long run. Where are we going to be in 10 years? What are the most important things we need to work toward that really take energy and effort over many years to achieve? That, that's 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 really the best way I can add, Bill. You, you did such a nice job. No, I mean, I think your analogy is, is absolutely perfect. And and I think it's, it's perfect in so many ways, Mitch, because when you think about Tour de France, the, 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 it really is the team itself that is working close together to achieve an objective over a long course and a large number of days and a lot of hills and dales. So, so I, I hope that everybody can, can, in listening to this, instinctively will understand that vision and planning 
is an essential element that, of the most successful and healthy parishes. But what our data showed us and, and, and how we ended up coming up with that pillar was that there are actually four building blocks that are essential to be optimized to excellence. And it's when you optimize those four essential building blocks to excellence, you will have achieved a strong pillar of vision and planning. Now, those four building blocks are first, strategic planning, second, operational and tactical planning, third, parishioner involvement, and fourth, goal achievement and accountability. Now, we're going to cover briefly each of these, strategic planning, operational technical planning, parishioner involvement, and goal achievement accountability, just in a little detail. So let's start with the first building block that supports this, the, the pillar of, of vision and planning that is strategic planning. You know, as, as we mentioned at the outset, by the grace of God, we have all been blessed to work on so many strategic plans within the American Orthosphere with parishes, with metropolises, with dioceses, even a couple of national churches, and certainly a lot of Orthodox organizations. And, and what we have validated again and again and again is that strategic planning is essential in church world for, for several reasons. You know, kind of what Mitch was talking about. First of all, the clergy and the parish leaders suffer because of the distractions of daily demands. Again, what I call the tyranny of the urgent, as well as the absence of sufficient paid staff to execute on all their plans and dreams. Look, when you when you do strategic planning in your, in your own company or in your own business, chances are you have somebody whose job it is to execute on that. And, and yet in our churches, we have, it's primarily a volunteer activity. And we're gonna get to that in the fourth building block. But we have a shortage of workers and substantial parents challenges to address so what it means is you need to have a process to clarify your most critical, strategic, longer-term goals and objectives so that everyone can focus their attention on the few things that can change everything. Let me say that again. We want to focus our attention through these strategic plan efforts on the few things that we can impact that can change so many things. I mean, here are a few of the direct quotes from the Orthodox mission field that we at Orthodox Ministry Services hear regularly from both clergy and laity. These are all direct quotes. We just can't seem to get things done. Another one said, we get distracted too easily. Another one said, we have a lot of trouble finding volunteers and we're burning out our most active, usual ones. Some have said, we have great ideas, but, but they just don't ever seem to get implemented. We can't always agree on what our most important priorities are, and sometimes we can't always see the forest from the trees. Another commented that church doesn't seem to be as important to our parishioners as many other things are. And then another one cautioned, I'm not sure if we're ever going to get back to normal after the COVID pandemic, let alone growing and expanding. We just don't know what to do or what to prioritize. Indeed, the, the Franklin Covey organization looked at over 200,000 entities, both nonprofit churches and for-profit, and they concluded, and I quote, once you've decided what to do, your biggest challenge is getting people to execute it at the level of excellence you need, end quote. Does that sound familiar to any of you working in the church world? Is, is, are any of those concerns that you've heard us tell from, that we've been hearing from others true at your parish? It, it was it was Thomas Edison who was once reported to have said, quote, vision without execution is hallucination. <laughs> vision without execution is hallucination. And, and this is why we on the, the parish team at Orthodox Ministry Services are so committed to helping Orthodox Christian parishes, dioceses, metropolises, and national churches develop strategic plans. Now, I'm again, I'm going to bring in Mitch Owen over here because Mitch has been involved in doing what he calls strategic positioning with a lot of colleges and universities, other nonprofits, and even Orthodox parishes. Mitch, what are some of the biggest insights that, that you see about the critical importance in our churches of doing these strategic plans that we've been working on? Well, I think from my standpoint, um, it's about getting people to appreciate the discussions they need to have, the conversations they need to have that focus on really big things that matter, things that make a difference but take a while to do. Uh, we tend to solve a lot of little problems um, on the regular day-to-day -day kind of running a parish, running a church, um, but we don't really get together and focus on what's big, what, what matters. And in doing so, we don't focus. We try to do everything. 
um, everybody has an agenda and everybody has a piece. And I think the conversation we have with communities when they think about how do we strategically position ourselves for the place of most potential, the greatest opportunity for the growth in our faith and the growth in our community, when we can get them to agree on the three or four focus areas they want to work on, they have, it, it impacts the entire community and, and all the other pillars actually benefit uh, in some right. way uh, by that effort. Uh, so the strategic thinking and strategic um, planning or positioning is really about focus on big, what's, what's really going to matter, and having communities have that conversation. And that's not an easy conversation to do on your own usually. And it's also not a conversation you do when you're pressed to get the church open on Sunday or, or whatever it is that you're focused on as a council or as a community. Uh, it's not a day-to-day -day thing. It's really something where you're stepping back and looking down the road. Yeah. That's, that's a great way to put it. I, I, sometimes I refer to it as going to the mountaintop time. You know, when you go to the mountaintop and you really reflect on, you know, we're going in the right direction. Now, there's obviously, my brothers and sisters, an enormous amount more we can and would say about strategic planning. But we hope that we've, we've at least laid the foundation of why that is an important building block of the whole pillar of vision and planning. But I want to segue over to the second of those building blocks. And it's kind of the brother or sister or cousin of strategic planning. It's the operational and tactical planning. Now, as, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there is this kind of difference between the strategic longer-term goals and the tactical operational shorter-term goals. And, and while Mitch and I have discussed kind of the importance to Paris of long and intermediate-term strategic goals, sometimes of more immediate importance to parishes are the Paris establishing an, a discipline, a rhythm of annual operational and tactical planning. And the best parishes have a formal process for each of the ministries to engage in annual operational planning that then feed up to form an overall parish annual operational plan. Now, Steve, uh, you're with us, and I know that this is an area that you spend a lot of time on and help parishes with and focus on. So why don't you offer a few words about the importance of the building block of this operational and tactical planning? Everyone, uh the, the operational and tactical planning element, and as Mitch or Dr. Mitch and Bill have alluded to already, there's a great deal of interplay between the pillars and the building blocks, as you will see as we go through uh, the six, as we uh, culminate on Wednesday. One of the most frequent questions I'm asked uh, when doing a strategic plan is, so what's going to happen to it? And we've talked about execution. <laughs> yeah. And the, the key on that is to look at the integration between the goals and objectives that you have in your strategic plan and making those a reality into your annual plan. Now, the best parishes that I've had the opportunity to work with uh, hold annual reviews, annual planning sessions inv involving all ministries. They annually review the strategic plan to see how they're doing uh, they report against progress or a lack thereof. Uh, reporting uh, a, a lack of progress is important because it, it demonstrates transparency. But from an operational perspective, as we've said before, the parish needs to be focusing in on a few things over a couple of years. But the way you get there is the annual involvement and the annual progression toward those goals in a unified manner. So look at some of the areas that are you know, blocking and tackling, very simple things, but it's the simple things that get us there. You know, in the operational and tactical area, we look at just an operating annual plan. What does it look like? How to establish goals? Uh, are ministries engaged in the planning process? Oh, key uh, point, are, key point. Yeah, that's yeah. a good one. Are, are ministries uh, set off on their own and then they have to figure out how to raise money, or is that integrated into an overall budget for the parish? Um, you know, are we asking our ministries to uh, identify a budget? Uh, are they reporting against a budget? And so many times we defer everything back to a, a central parish council planning arm, uh, but the reality is that ministry is occurring all over the parish, at least in effective parishes, 
it is not just a, a centralized body that's doing all the work. It's the hands of all the parishioners. So the, in order to have a strategic plan work, uh, it has to be integrated into the annual planning process. The annual planning process then allows the parish to do some of those things like fundraising, like stewardship analysis, uh, and specific programs that may or may not be involved in the strategic plan, but have to occur within the parish. But it, it, it requires an integration between the master plan and the annual plan uh, one of the things that I see as a critical and one of the things that I use in, in parishes is I want every plan, the strategic plan and the operating plan, to have as many fingerprints on it as possible, uh, meaning that we want as much parishioner input as possible because if my fingerprint is on a plan, the likelihood of supporting that plan and being engaged in that plan uh, goes up tremendously. So uh, a little different skill set, a little more tactical uh, it usually goes out about 12 months in the planning cycle of, as opposed to the strategic plan, but extremely important uh, for the unification and the direction of the parish. Fantastic. And I hope that people are starting to see that we have this longer term strategic plan that sets the, the big vision course, but we have these annual operational and tactical plans. And Steve, you did a perfect job of segueing into the third building block. And that building block is parishioner involvement. Again, vision and planning that is done just by one person or a small number of people will never have the level of engagement and a success that one that includes parishioner involvement. And now all of us that on the OMS Parish team do strategic planning have some different ways that we like to engage the faithful in, in building a consensus. Uh, so, you know, I, I know that, that Steve does surveying and what. I, I use a SWOT analysis, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And not only do we we get everybody on the entire strategic planning team to do a SWOT analysis. We ask the entire parish to engage in the SWOT analysis and give us their feedback. And I also will hold um, uh, open forums within the community to engage in that in that opportunity. So again, what we're trying to do here, to, to Steve's point, is get as large a group of people as we can engaged in the process of informing the decisions that are going to be made in the vision and plan that we're trying to uh, to accomplish. And and yes, that includes everybody, not just the same old usual suspects, the 80-20 rule, the 20% of the people that are running everything, but but also, um, you know, the catechumens and the people that are on their journey into the church and some of the new parishioners and some of the young parishioners, because, again, it's so important that we hear from as many different people, as many different voices as possible so that we can engage the entire community in sharing both the, the annual and operating tactical plans that Steve talked about and the long-term and strategic plans that Mitch talked about. So it's really important when you're establishing a consensus behind either your long-range plan or your short-range annual plan that you have the broadest perspective of people that you can and that they are engaged in the process so that they help own the process. And it's not one of those situations where, you know, the leader says, we're going to take this hill and they get up to the top of the hill and they look around and there ain't nobody behind them. Now, Mitch, I know one of the things that you, you actually do some other creative ways of engaging people in the journey of helping to build the vision and plans, both short and long term. Can you just share with people some of the things that you do? And remember, folks, the reason why we're going into this is to inform you as to how these building blocks were created and how the effective parish assessment actually is assessing your own parish's use of these successful techniques. So, Mitch, why don't you share some of the creative things you do for engaging parishioners in planning? Sure, Bill. I'll be glad to. Um, you know, I, I'll start out with one phrase I love to say, and that is the amount of time that you engage someone in thought and discussion about the future of your community is directly related to the amount of time and energy they will contribute later in helping you achieve whatever vision you come up with. Wait, say and that I again. That's important really important. That, say it again. Say it again. It's really important. So You're the right. amount of time that you engage others in thought and discussion about how they feel and what they think about the community and the needs of the community, the amount of time you give to that endeavor is directly proportional to the amount of energy that human being is going to give you in helping you achieve a vision later. Uh, it, it's too often we assume we know the answers. We don't need to talk to people. We know what we ought to do. And what ends up happening is 
whether you get it right or wrong, it doesn't really matter because you didn't ask my thoughts, you didn't ask me to be a part of it. I don't have a lot of energy to give you because you didn't engage me. And I think the fear that most people have is that actually asking parishioners for input is imposing on them. But in truth, we're not. We're asking them for input so that they feel some ownership, so they feel some part of the process. Um, and, you know, we use, you know, groups use surveys, they use engagement efforts. One model that I've used extensively is turning individuals into interviewers and having them interview as many people as they can and then come back and teach the rest of the community what they learned from those interviews. So that, you know, if everybody can be a student during the process and everybody can be a teacher, then we get away from the old paradox of who knows the most in the room gets to say where we're gonna go. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is this has to be a shared vision and a shared consensus. And so breaking that down through process and by engaging people um, in, in thoughtful discussion, and Bill was naming lots of groups there really is it's an unlimited number of individuals yep. you can speak to um and i find what's really enlightening is when communities actually talk to people that quit coming to church or individuals who never came to church or interviewed or discussed things with communities that they live in that are not members of their church they're they're actual community leaders and people that's that come to their festivals every year but don't know anything about their church. And they learn interesting perceptions of themselves and interesting messages that they're giving that maybe aren't what they wanna be giving. So it, it's really about having a good design process that spends a lot of time learning before we start talking about where we want to go. And I'll end Bill with this like analogy. I remember the first time I was on council and I went to the first meeting and it seemed like, oh, half the council already thought they knew what we should do. <laughs> and yeah. I was new. And and I was like, I don't know enough to know who's right. Yeah. And right. they all argued a bunch about who was right. And right. we didn't get very far. Yeah. And I think in parishioner involvement, if done properly, and, and I'll make one other contrast, understanding the right questions to ask yes. is just as important as engaging them. And we won't get too in depth in there. That's a whole nother program, Bill, that you could do. But understanding what questions are good questions for thought and discovery and learning versus what questions are not good because they drive us to bipolar views and, you know, positions that of, of disagreement is very critical. And so I, I think that it's not just that we engage them, but and what questions we do it and how we do it in a meaningful way to where when we're done, they feel like they are part of the process. Right. And that's, and, that's and kind I think, of my piece, Bill. No, that's perfect. And and I mean, I think one of the other byproducts of this, and I know you've had this experience, I know Steve has had this experience, and certainly I've had this experience where all of a sudden, somebody who is adamant that this is the most important issue, when they look at all the responses and all the data that comes in from the community, realizes that what they think is most important is not shared by the community as a whole. And then rather than you telling them they're an outlier, they can see the data and the insights and the discussion for themselves. And then they have to themselves now make a decision about how can they come about it. That's not to say that they can't work on whatever it is they think that's most important. But, but what it does mean is they can't dominate that as an objective of the whole. And until you have the data and information, you don't really know the answer to that question. And again, that's really what our effective parish assessment tool is trying to do, is it's trying to gather the critical data about your parish's health in this area. Now, the fourth of the building blocks in the vision and planning pillar is goal achievement and accountability. You've heard Mitch talk about it. You've heard Steve talk about it. And you've heard me talk about it because it's inexorably tied both to your long-term strategic plan as well as your short-term operational planning. I mean, I, I always talk about the four Ps of successful strategic planning, and you have to have the right people go through the right process to develop the best plan that's properly performed. But regrettably, about 50% or more of strategic and operational plans in parishes and nonprofits fail. 
And, and while sometimes they may fail because they have the wrong people or the wrong process or the plan, more often than not, they primarily fail because they didn't properly execute against their short-term or long-term plans. And the Franklin Covey organization that released their best-selling book, The Four Disciplines of Execution, after studying over 200,000 organizations, amongst their amazing findings was that 15% of the people in an organization couldn't even name one of the organization's most important goals. They couldn't even name one. And and 51% of the team couldn't say that they were passionate about the team's goals. And and in their data, staggering 81% reported that they weren't held accountable for regular process of the organization's goal. And as, as you listen to what Steve had said about the annual operational planning cycle and what Mitch said about the accountability for the long-term plan, hopefully you'll come to understand why the one of the four essential building blocks of vision and planning is goal achievement and accountability. And, and this is one of the drivers that we put in every one of the strategic plans that we work on with parishes. But frankly, it's one of the outcomes that comes out of our effective parish assessment process. So we've tried to very briefly summarize. And I mean, as Mitch said earlier, we can do whole programs on each of these building blocks, and maybe we should. But And over time, the Effective Parish uh, a website will include content, extraordinarily deep content on each of these areas. But what we wanted to do is just give you a high-level insight into the first pillar pillar of operational excellence, a vision and planning, which consists of four building blocks, strategic planning, operational and tactical planning, parishioner involvement, and goal achievement and accountability. And when you take the effective parish assessment, you actually are having the community as a whole evaluate your parish on its effectiveness in that pillar in those four building blocks. So we're going to take another short break right now. When I come back, we're going to continue to explore the effective parish assessment program that will assess your parish's effectiveness in six pillars and 30 30 building blocks. And we're going to get into the second of those pillars when we come right back after this short break. Bill will be right back, but the lines are open if you want to ask a question or offer your thoughts. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. For all of us, male or female, parent or not, that's what it's often like, isn't it? It's at the end of our own tether that the miracle happens. It is in our greatest weakness that God's strength is known. It's when we decrease that He can increase. It's in losing our life that we find it. To put it another way, it's in the spot where St. Morwenna falls down, exhausted that her spring rises up. It's when the people of God curse Moses in the wilderness and wish themselves back in Egypt that they hear the crack of the staff, the gush of water through the rock. It's when God himself is spat upon and mocked and bleeding and dead that the glorious resurrection is ushered in. From Seven Holy Women, Conversations with Saints and Friends, now available as an audiobook at Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. Stewardship Calling is back, and we are ready for your call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Here again is Bill Marianis. Welcome back to Stewardship Calling in our fifth Sunday program where we're exploring the effective parish assessment program and how your parish can receive a valuable and free service with my colleagues at Orthodox Ministry Services. Again, for those of you that are interested, you can go to effectiveparish.org and for any Orthodox parish, you can you can click on the the uh, the page there that's really for the Orthodox EPA, that's the Effective Parish Assessment. And if you're interested, you can send uh, you can register at info at at effectiveparish.org. And if you're one of the GOA parishes that would like to participate in the Leadership 100 uh, special program, you can go to the second page, GOA EPAP, again at effectiveparish.org, and uh, let us know at cohortparish.org. And during the break, we've gotten another registrant. So thank you all for listening and paying attention. Now we're going to shift our focus to the second of the the six pillars of the most effective and healthy parishes. We talked about vision and planning. Now we're going to talk about the second one, leadership in teams. Now, Mitch is kind of the team leader, if you will, in this area. I'd like to start by asking you to explain the why 
of, of having leadership and teams be one of the most critical pillars in an effective and healthy parish? What's it all about? Thanks, Bill. Um, let me start by saying, and I may get in trouble with my teammates here, but of the six pillars, this one pillar drives all the other pillars and that all the other pillars have to be done by leadership, by somebody leading it, whether it's creating a vision, ensuring stewardship, running ministries, whatever it is. And so the first thing I would say, the why of it is, is in bolts of what makes an organization operate, leadership. Leadership is pretty much the defined defining moment of success. Uh, I think back to good to great, and Jim Collins' excellent yeah. work of studying the greatest organizations in the world. His first major chapter in that book is about the leader and that that was the one thing that he found that was significant that made a difference in those organizations being great compared to other organizations that were average or even worse. So when we think of leadership, we're thinking of the human beings that give um, the effort to bring in the community to where it needs to go, but not just in the council, but in all, all levels of organization, teams and organization. How do we attract and bring people into volunteership? How do we ensure that we have the financing running and the organization working? It all comes back to human capital and human capital basically is led. So that's, I mean, it's, it's so basic, Bill, it's almost hard to describe as other than just a common sense thing that if we don't have strong leadership, and, I, and I'll add that in the communities I've worked with where we had strong leadership, it was much easier to do just yeah. about everything. Yeah. Uh, in the communities where we don't have people stepping forward, where leadership has in some ways not performed at a level to where it's grown new leadership, where it's not uh, created organizational structures that lead uh, to success on goals, uh, that ensure accountability. And you can go back to look at just about every derailment of any kind of um, community, and there was a leadership weakness. There was something that wasn't working. So this is kind of the no-brainer one. I, I hate to say it that way, uh, <laughs> given that I'm the one given leadership. But this was the easy one. I think uh, the the you know the building blocks been, are not as easy. And I think we tend to think of leadership sometimes in ways that is not clear. In other words, we have different definitions for what that means. Um, the the contrast I'll use is if you've run a business by yourself your whole life, you may think leadership is making decisions and and driving the horse forward. Uh, if you've been a member of a nonprofit organization leadership team, you realize it's a consensus effort. Um, and so there are times when leadership styles create problems. So it's very important that we uh, define leadership in a proper way and we grow those leaders within our communities. Perfect. That's a great foundation. And, and you make it sound so easy. And yet, as you point out, <laughs> in, in any time when we see a failure, you know, yes, there's always a failure of execution, but almost always there's similarly a failure of leadership. So when we look at the, the leadership and teams element of this pillar, what, what we discovered was that there were several building blocks underneath it. And those five building blocks, and we're just going to take a few minutes to explore each of them, were Christian leadership, number two, leadership and coaching, number three, conflict management, number four, effective teams, and the number five, again, unique to the church environment, parish councils and boards. So let's start with the Christian leadership building block. And I know, Steve, this is something that is kind of near and dear to your heart uh, and something that I'm studying a lot more right now. So why don't you share just a little bit about what we mean when we start talking about Christian leadership and why this building block has to be assessed at a parish in order to assess its effectiveness? Sure. Thank you, Bill. So in my work with parishes, uh, I'm going to start with an unfortunate. And sometimes there are issues between leaders and priests and ministries. Uh, in my work, the most fundamental common issue, if there is conflict among the leadership team, is a lack of regular participation in the liturgical life of the church, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that people approach in their leadership role, using their prior leadership or outside leadership skills that they have in the secular world, trying to apply those in a setting, in a church setting. 
and a, 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 an effective leader understands the context and represents the context of their institution. So number one, a leader needs to be involved in the liturgical life of the church. Now, I'm not making any value judgments on how often someone participates in liturgy or if they go to confession, that's not for me to assess. But it just seems to be that when there is conflict, uh, there is a lack of that. And the flip side of that is when there is harmony, when there is alignment, when there is true forgiveness and love amongst the leaders, that parish leaders are involved in the liturgical life of the church. They do treat themselves with Christian love and all those that they uh, work with in the parish. So the first thing on being a Christian leader is to be a good Christian. Uh, and also be that individual that encourages participation in worship and make sure that the decisions that are reached reflect a Christian outlook uh, in the decisions. And sometimes that means staying right to policy and sometimes that means uh, having the discernment to know when to make another decision. Yeah. And so, yeah. uh, because sometimes we can state a policy and, and uh, come out with the, the wrong solution, if you will. Right. So that's the first kind of core element in that Christian leadership are the principles uh, of the individuals. And I know uh, Mitch and, and Bill and, and I, and also Nick Jacobs have all studied this in terms of what are the different attributes uh, that someone brings forward uh, as a leader. And by the way, by definition, we're not talking about someone that has just been, you know, voted onto a parish council, that there are leaders throughout the parish, uh, ministry leaders that are appointed, uh, organization leaders that are appointed or uh, appointed by their particular organizations, but also, you know, a Sunday school teacher, uh, a youth uh, leader, those are all leaders to the constituents that they are serving, uh, meaning the children in the classroom or someone else. So uh, we have to also make sure that when we're looking at leaders, that we recognize that it's just not the official election process that's identifying leaders. It's really anybody that's in a leadership role within the parish. And I think that's really important so you so that y'all that are listening will understand that when we are doing the effective parish assessment, the tool that that we're going to be releasing, one of the things we're looking at is the degree to which this these incredibly important notions of Christian leadership that Steve has articulated, how far do they reach beyond just the proestamino or the head priest or the parish council president? Do they reach into the ministries and some of the other activities? So Christian leadership is one of those foundational elements of leadership in teams. The, the second foundational building block that we found was leading and coaching, leading and coaching. And I know, Mitch, this is something you spend a lot of time working on. So why don't you start by telling us a little bit about the, the way we're assessing this leading and coaching and why it's so important. Thanks, Bill. I, you know, the first thing I would point out is that you can be successful and not be a good leader. You can be successful at work. You can be uh, brilliant in a scientific area or in a technical area. Um, you could be a great programmer. You could be very successful and still not be a good leader. And I think that's one of our challenges is that very, very few of us are trained to be great leaders and to coach others. We, we're trained to do a task or a job. So when we think of leading, we're talking about individuals who can assess their own strengths and weaknesses and have a, a sense of... Um, where they, where they fall, what they do well, what they don't do well, that have the ability to build trust and develop that trust in others and demonstrate it by keeping their word, keeping their commitments and achieving uh, what they say they're going to achieve. We think of people who can uh, actively seek input, listen well, and learn from others and work with others, and even seek others out and develop them to be future leaders. So these are these are qualities that um, we may not come to a, a ministry leadership role with those skills, but we need to continue to develop them. Um, I think also I would say the ability to have vulnerability and humility and acknowledge and say, hey, I messed up or I didn't do that well. Um, and the ability to celebrate other success, not be as competitive with others, but see it as a team trying to work. 
Um, and I think just to tie back to that coaching, it, you know, great leaders develop themselves continuously through their entire life. They also develop others through coaching them. And, and when we have a perfect environment where in a parish, we see leaders who are actually developing new people to follow in their footsteps, to take over in the roles they're leading, rather than clinging to those roles like they give meaning to who they are. Uh, they see those yeah. roles really as con con contributions, not as uh, status symbols or, or uh, you know, something to hold on to for credibility and, and, and enforcement. Um, so I think those are some of the things we think of when we think of leading and coaching and, and do, do leaders within the community. And like Steve said, not just your council, but everyone who's in a leadership role. And I often make the argument, everybody is in a leadership role in some way. They're leading yeah. their family. They're leading their um, community. They're leading uh, small groups. If they're helping in a in an operation of the, the say the festival or they're helping with a, a youth event, Everybody takes on leadership roles at times, and so it's important that we stress that as an important component. Well, that's that's a great way to put it. So one of the things we're looking at in the effective parish assessment is looking at a way to assess how good is your parish doing at developing leaders and coaching others to be leaders. And let's segue over to the next one so you can handle it also, Mitch, because I know this is something that is very near and dear to your heart. And that is the building block of conflict management. Conflict is 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 it's going to be it's inevitable in any church organization, frankly, in any organization, human organization, right? And uh, for those of you that uh, are interested in more depth on this, by the way, uh, the April seventh and May fifth, twenty twenty one stewardship calling programs. That's April seventh, twenty twenty one, and May fifth. 2021. Uh, I interviewed actually Mitch Owen right here on uh, managing and having difficult conversations and dealing with conflict. But why don't you share just a little bit about this whole notion of conflict management and what are some of the things that we're looking at in the effective parish assessment to help a parish get better? Uh, thank you, Bill. And I think the, the first thing we need to say about conflict management is nobody likes conflict. That's not necessarily true. There are a certain group of people that actually enjoy creating conflict. But in a parish community, um, it's almost like we feel bad if we're in conflict and we don't really have straightforward conflict. It almost gets buried in, and it becomes almost a, a sickness, an illness that creates passive aggressive behavior that's not healthy. And so the first thing we think of when we think is, is a healthy parish is, do they have the ability to recognize and address situations where there are conflicts? Yeah. And and deal with dissent in an open way. That dissent is an okay thing. Dissent yeah. is an opportunity to learn. We come to decisions with different viewpoints because we have different knowledge, learning, and experience. And this has never been more important than today where we have more diversity within our cultures within the Orthodox Church. And so we come with different practices and traditions and, and there's reason for those differences. And that dissent is okay. It is okay to have different viewpoints. And so first of all, it's about kind of allowing it to happen, acknowledging that it's okay. This, there's, there's other things then is about the skill set, the, the skill set of being able to, you know, work with others that have different viewpoints and facilitate discussions in a way and negotiate and resolve those differences effectively. Uh, maybe not completely, but at a point where everybody in the community can live with the solutions that we're coming up with um, and, and set guidelines for how we're going to move forward and then hold ourselves to those guidelines. Um, I find that in my work with parishes, this is the area that is the most, uh, I won't say in need, it's the most ignored it's like we avoid the conflict, so we avoid addressing it, and we try to work around it. And it actually splinters and affects everything else. It ends yeah. up creating yeah. leadership challenges, or it ends up creating um, a lack of volunteership because I don't want to work with that person, or I don't want to do right. that. And so part of this area of conflict management is developing a skill set. And I'll say, you know, I won't go into it now because that's we have a great piece and that you can go listen to, but I would say to you, building our skill set and being able to discuss things with people we disagree with is a lifelong journey. Uh, I've been <laughs> teaching it 30 years and I still don't handle conversations always like I should. 
and I have to correct myself afterward and apologize. Um, but it is an important area, and it is probably one of those pieces that if communities can address and get to where they handle it better, it's a huge lift to moving them forward and making them successful in everything else they're doing, Bill. Yeah, I know that's well said. And the other part of that that is so critically important for us to remember, particularly in the church context, is it is actually personifying Christ's great commandment in John 13, 34, 35, to love one another. And when we love one another, we can deal with a conflict and find a way to work through it without creating that permanent fissure that, that sometimes happens. So that's why that third building block under the, the leadership and teams is so important of conflict management. And this is one of the things that we assess in the effective parish assessment. Now, the remaining two building blocks on the leadership and teams are actually building effective teams and then the parish council and board component, which is kind of a subset of that. And so, Steve, would you spend a few minutes talking a little bit about what are some of the things we're looking at in terms of the effectiveness of teams that are created within the parish and the effectiveness of the parish council and boards within the parish? Sure. So looking at both effective teams and, and the effectiveness of parish councils and boards, uh, you know, there are certain uh, processes that worked really well and have worked well in parishes and ministries that can be shared. And it can be anywhere from uh, meeting management, internal communication, uh, uh, aligning parish councils to ministries, aligning parish council members to a variety of activities. Uh, but it has to start with the composition. Now, we don't have the ability to self-select or have selected uh, parish council members. That's, as we know, those are uh, annual votes. Um, but effective leadership teams really have a representation of their constituency. Uh, they have diverse skills, they have diverse backgrounds, and they appreciate those backgrounds. As Mitch mentioned, they appreciate the, the sometimes divergent views that someone will bring in if everyone is delivering it in a notion of, of love and respect. But if we look at effective teams, uh, not only are they going to have these diverse skills, uh, they're going to uh, celebrate the successes of others. Uh, they are not there for personal uh, uh, glory, if you will. Uh, they are there to uh, empower individuals, grow individuals, and, and give the opportunity for individuals to use their own skills and gifts to the glory of God. Uh, in addition, from a parish council perspective, uh, we're going to encourage both positive and maybe not so positive inputs because we have to deal in an area that's reality, if you will. Uh, parish councils absolutely have to work effectively with the priest. Uh, that That is uh, many times overlooked. And the notion that the priest handles all the religious stuff, <laughs> the parish council handles everything else, is a huge misnomer. What? Uh, You're telling me is, that's not true? I mean, that's what I hear uh, everywhere, Steve. <laughs> well, the flip side is when things go wrong, it's the priest's fault. Of course, when yeah. When things go well, uh, it's, uh, it's the parish council doing what they're supposed to do. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so it, it is a it absolutely is a cooperative uh, uh, effort. Uh, and then you know the the parish council and the boards work effectively. They they embrace the vision as we talked about earlier, and uh, they manage responsibly. They make sure that. Uh, all the areas of uh, managerial responsibility, from finances uh, to program implementations to community events, uh, outreach, uh, they are supporting all those efforts and they are creating uh, trust through the ability mm -hmm. to be transparent. Uh, because if you have trust, you will, you will, excuse me, if you're transparent, you will increase. Uh, your level of trust. Uh, no one's perfect. No one's 100% right. Uh, but if I own up to my mistakes and I can explain what happened and why we didn't do what we did, uh, people may not like the result, but they can't fault the fact that you're not trying, you know, they, 
that you're at least being honest and open and transparent. And that probably has a, the greatest impact of trust. Um, so, you know, all these elements, we, we have a variety of, of materials and views that we, again, at another time, we'll be able to share on what effective parish councils, uh, boards, and ministry uh, teams uh, do out there. Well, that, that, that was a perfect explanation and a great segue so that listeners understand that the effective parish assessment is actually assessing your parish on the effectiveness of each of these building blocks and each of these pillars. But ultimately, what our vision is, is that the effective parish website and well and the, the kind of whole vision if you will of orthodox ministry services on the parish side of the house is to create those tools and processes and and actually take the short explanations that you're hearing tonight to the full extent of those explanations that all of our expert team members are able to do so that we can actually provide you the resources but now we're just focused on the assessment phase and so in the second pillar you see us talking about leadership and teams that kind of essential building block, as Mitch mentioned, that, you know, without it, you're not going to have anything accomplished in that regard. And the teams around them that that Steve talked about that have to be aligned and have to be working together. And that pillar is measured by the effectiveness of the Christian leadership principles of your leaders, the leading and coaching that takes place, the way you resolve the inevitable conflicts that are going to happen, the way you build, manage, and operate your teams, and ultimately the effectiveness of the parish council and boards. And that's why those five building blocks are independently measured and, and assessed in your parish so that we can help you identify where any weak spots are that you can then go and fill. So we're going to take one final short break. And when I come back, we're going to continue the exploration of the effective parish assessment tool and the six pillars and 30 building blocks by focusing on the third and last building block we're going to cover today. So remember, we'd welcome your calls and questions at one eight five five af radio That's one eight five five two three seven two three four six. So let's take one short final break right now. Bill will be right back, but the lines are open if you want to ask a question or offer your thoughts. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. New from Ancient Faith Publishing. Secret Turning, a collection of short stories by Stephen Signori. So, I'm out in the lot of Little Heaven. And up comes Father Naum from behind, grabs me, gives me a kiss, and tells me he's happy to see me. Wearing his worn-out dungaree bib overalls with the beat-up straw Stetson, pulling his wire basket, going shopping on the avenue. How old is Naum anyway? Sharky asked. Older than he acts, Lefty said. Two beer red, he said, yeah, and younger than he seems. So he says to me, Theodri, the church is much better when you're there. It's not the whole family when we don't see you. You know, God misses his children, and Nana Olga misses her son. Now available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook at store.ancientfaith.com. Stewardship Calling is back, and we are ready for your call at 855 237 2346. That's 855 AF Radio. Here again is Bill Marianis. Well, welcome back to the final segment of tonight's program on the Effective Parish Assessment. Remember that we're looking for anybody that's interested to go to EffectiveParish.org, and you can sign up if you're interested at info at EffectiveParish.org, and we'll put you on the distribution list for when the time comes to roll it out. And if you're one of the GOA parishes that would like to participate in the Leadership 100 more extensive program, you can sign up at CohortParish at EffectiveParish.org. Now, the third and final pillar we're going to talk about tonight, leaving three more for Wednesday, is the pillar of stewardship and generosity. And if, if you're a regular listener to this program, you'll know that if there's one thing I'm passionate about more than even strategic planning, it is actually the issue of stewardship and generosity. And it's really no accident that my ministry has called Stewardship Calling, because as I mentioned at the outset, uh, Holy Scripture teaches us in, in many places, actually, that your creator in whose image and likeness you were made 
made gave you unique talents and abilities so that you could be a steward over those talents, gifts, and abilities. And it's this life's work that really is what is going to ask you that give you the opportunity to have that good account before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. And indeed, we know that if a parish does not foster a culture of generosity and stewardship over all of the gifts of its parishioners, it can't thrive. And in many cases, it only barely survives. And, and it's kind of for this reason that teaching the obligation of stewardship over God's gifts and calling and to be generous with them is one of the foundational pillars. And um, before I get to my caller right now, we've got a caller where I'm going to take it in just a second. I want to kind of make sure that we set the tone here. Uh, those of you that are regular listeners will have heard this. If you're not, you'll understand that there's really four types of generosity that parishioners and parishes practice. There's, number one, the annual stewardship tie, the annual contribution that we make to support our operations of our parish. Secondly, there's periodic capital campaigns that we use to raise money specifically to acquire or construct or improve parish capital assets. The third kind of generosity that we need to foster is emergency philanthropy. We all know what that is. There's a, a crisis, a tsunami, an earthquake, a war, or something, and we need to raise some emergency funds to help address the huge needs that arise. And the fourth one, and we're going to talk about this one uh, a little bit tonight, is on planned giving. That's estate gifts to fund the non-operating parish needs and operations in the future. And if, and if, if a parish is properly integrating all four types of generosity in a culture of generosity, these four types are not cannibalistic of each other. In fact, they don't reduce generosity. And I'm going to give you some data that shows they actually increase generosity. So there are six building blocks that I'm going to quickly go through in the pillar of stewardship and generosity. But before I do, we have a caller on the line, Brother Sam from Michigan. Sam, are you with us? Hi. I am, Bill. How are you? God bless, brother. It's good to hear your voice again. How are you doing? I'm doing really good. As you know, you uh, helped us, coached us through a strategic plan, and I uh, was listening to your section here on building effective teams. And uh, I think I'm a little weak in building teams. Uh, each each wig that we have has a team of leaders, and they all have differing degrees of leadership ability. And and. I think I need help in how to coach them to be good leaders, run meetings and things like that. Any suggestions? Oh, yeah. Boy, do we ever. And I mean, look, you're, you're a good example, Sam, because, uh, uh, in fact, if, if you don't know who I'm talking to, uh, Sam was actually on one of my uh, stewardship calling programs right after we finished the second retreat at his beautiful parish uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And, and you know, the, the thing that we're looking at here, Sam, is, I mean, look, you've run you, you run a very successful business, so you know how to you know how to do that kind of thing. But organizing and coaching a team for a church operation, and particularly for the kind of thing you're doing, Sam's leading the implementation of the strategic plan at, at St. Nicholas Parish, um, is is some of the same skill sets, but some different skill sets. So I, I don't want to get too bogged down in the details because we actually have a whole series of modules that we're going to release on that. But I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call on my brothers, uh, Mitch and, and Steve, to jump in here now. And you're now, you're now talking to the head coach of a strategic planning process at a parish that has very good, wildly important goals that they're trying to execute, and he wants to improve his game at managing the co-captains of those goals. So, Brother Mitch and Brother Steve, what advice are you going to give our good brother Sam? I'm waiting to see if Steve will go first. Uh, how how uh, uncharacteristic. Uh, if if, if y'all could listen to any of our me, regular me, sessions, me, we are all jumping in. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mitch. Well, yeah, let, that, let me that's, start, that's Steve, and you help out. Well, you know, Mitch, that's such, such uh, a simple question. I'll let you take it. Oh, okay, and, okay. Yeah, it's too easy uh, for you yeah. to handle. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, Sam, here's what I would say to you. You're like a patient that just called the doctor and said, I'm sick, but I don't have any, I haven't told me the symptoms, haven't told me the challenges. So Bingo. prescribing a solution for you is really more of an in-depth conversation and someone that something may even require a discussion, and not just with you, but with all your leaders of your teams about what are we doing well, what are we not doing well, what is what is our biggest challenges as leaders. The other piece I would say to you, Sam, is that leadership development is a great thing to embed within a strategic planning effort. 
so that as you're doing it, you're doing some growth and development. So one suggestion I might give you is to um, find a good leadership book that's uh, that, that teaches some tactics and skill sets of leadership and have a monthly conversation with or a book read with your leadership about how are we taking these principles and applying them to how we're doing our strategic plan. There's, there's lots of things like that. But like I said, I, I don't even know the symptoms of the illness. So how can I describe a solution? But I think it would be a wonderful conversation for us to have. And Steve, I'll let you chime in now. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, drifts from the pier is an understanding of focus. And uh, while sometimes we break the huddle off a strategic planning process, what happens is we will empower leaders to go out and lead their teams or lead the charge in some areas. And something happens along the way, whether it's a personal bias or just some confusion, that all of a sudden you find that the route that that person is taking, the destination, the vision where that person is headed, it has drifted from the original direction. And so what happens is that that individual, uh, for very good reasons, is moving forward, but because of the lack of communication and the touch points, uh, they may have drifted away in their direction. And sometimes it's just uh, doing regular follow-up, tune-ups, check-ins with the leaders to ask them what they need, how their direction is going, and then do a soft redirect. Uh, because if it drifts too far directionally, then it's a major redirection and takes a lot more effort. So uh, that's one of the things that I, that I found is that individuals are not willfully trying to redirect. They just, for whatever reason, uh, start to take an initiative in, in a slightly different direction than maybe the leader or the person that was doing the assignment has given to them. Um, so that's that's one of the common things that, that I always encourage is the, the soft redirects and the soft check-ins uh, just to make sure everybody is on, on target. And I think that's Thank a great... Know. That's a great segue, Sam, because I think that's one of the things when you and I talk this coming week, we're going to, I've sent you that email and I know we're going to talk sometime this coming week. Yeah. Let's, t let's spend a few, a few brain cycles going through, you know, we create a cadence of accountability and we create a scoreboard so that we can have a, an, uh, kind of an easier process and excuse to do what Steve just said. And that's to yeah. have those soft and regular touch points. And so to the extent that that's drifted and that's, as he points out, normal, we're going to get you back on track but you, you bring up a great point and this is the reason why that whole module that whole pillar on leadership and teams is so successful it's so integral because you know as, as Mitch said at the very outset even if you have the best plan if you don't have the right leadership and team to execute it it isn't going to work and so so that's why these pillars as you'll see when you see all six of them laid out they actually stand on their own, but they actually stand together to build this effective parish that we're talking about. And so that's why we, we started by built by looking at what are the building blocks. And it just happened to be that there were 30 and then they aggregated themselves uh, in some in some number into the six pillars. So we're going to spend some more time on each of those in much greater depth. What we're just trying to do right now is get everybody sensitive to the kinds of things we're looking at to assess so that when the parish goes through the effective parish assessment, they'll have an idea of where are their weaknesses that they need to focus more energy on. Does it make sense? Yep, makes sense. Thank you. Great show. Okay, Sam. Thank you so much for all you do. God bless you, brother. We'll talk this you week. Too. Yep. All right. So getting back to the getting back to the pillar of, of stewardship and generosity, the first of the building blocks underneath there is giving and tithing. And and look, without a doubt, the data shows that the healthiest and most effective parishes are those with a foundational core value of generosity, not just kind of giving when you're asked or in, in times of crisis, but where generosity is the default response. It requires an instinctive reaction by which your your first reaction is to figure out how you can help someone else, not wait for them to ask for your help. And that is a cultural phenomenon that has to be built from the ground up within the parish. And it's an individual response, but it also can be aggregated into a collective parish response. That's what true generosity is all about.
Now, as it turns out, the single most critical factor of the generosity culture of a parish is defining the ability to fully meet not just the minimum needs, but everything it should be doing to fulfill its mission. See, our budgets are generally described and defined around serving the minimum needs to meet our operating you know, operating expenses, rather than fulfilling the vision and mission that we're trying to accomplish. And so when you build that culture of generosity, the ability to tie into that first pillar of vision and planning becomes a lot easier. And of course, the scriptural gold standard for personal generosity, I've done a whole stewardship calling program on this, is the tithe. The the giving of the minimum, that's a minimum of 10% of our time, talents, and treasures. And so how we're doing on this first test of the effectiveness of our stewardship and generosity. Well, if you look at it, we've done a proxy tithe analysis of well over 275 Orthodox parishes, and the proxy median tithe analysis shows that on average, Orthodox Christians tend to give between half of 1% and seven-tenths of a percent of their income. Not 10%, but half a percent. And so just to give you a frame of reference purposes, just for, some, for those of you that are into data and numbers, if, if you looked at the annual proxy income of Orthodox folks in America, this is hard, reliable data from three years ago. The, the newer numbers haven't been released. But the average Orthodox income, excuse me, the median, the halfway point, half make more, half make less, of Orthodox uh, Christians in America is $81,750, $81,750. And if you're sitting there saying, well, that ain't me, well, then you're on the the left side of the equation, but trust me, there's people on the right side of the equation. That's why it's the median number. If you just took a 10% tithe on that, that would mean a contribution of $8,175. Now, if you just do simple math, multiply the number of stewards you have in your church by $8,175. Remember, half are going to make less, and so they're going to give less, but half are going to make more and give a lot more. It'll, it'll end up about eighty-one seventy-five dollars per steward. So if your parish had 200 stewards, your stewardship income budget alone would be $1.64 million. Yeah, you heard me right. Stewardship income alone of $1.6 million annually. And if your parish has 300 families, for example, your stewardship income would be $2,450,000 per year. So tell me what wouldn't you be able to do? What kind of transformational work could you do in your ministries? And so because people ask about this, I mean, what's more fascinating is that the data, empirical data shows that 77% of those who tithe actually give more than 10%. And they give 10% or they give that percentage against their gross income, not their net income. And so this scriptural practice of tithing that was reinforced by St. John Chrysostom in the 4th century remains the gold standard of generosity. And yet, unfortunately, because our Orthodox churches in the U.S. were formed by our ancestors, like my father, who was an immigrant and from the old country where they never taught nor practiced tithing, it just hadn't been passed down. So to get there, a parish has to start with the emphasis on the scriptural foundation of percentage giving and move everybody up towards the tithe. And so what the effective parish assessment does is it gives us a validated metric that we can look at to see how is your parish doing with respect to teaching and practicing percentage giving on your way to being tithing. And that's really the first building block. Now, the second building block of the pillar of stewardship and generosity is the stewardship campaign. And it, let's be honest, most Orthodox parishes are lucky if they have a stewardship Sunday, let alone a comprehensive year-long stewardship campaign. And yet, best practices show that a year-long campaign is what is actually necessary to change the stewardship culture at a parish. So is it any wonder that so many of our parishes in the American orthosphere are struggling with their stewardship? And, and the year-long annual stewardship campaign includes a monthly component and a quarterly component and includes messaging and homilies and a, a, not a focus on the budget, not a focus on what we're missing, not a focus on, on, on how we're not covering our expenses, but on the life-changing ministries that our stewardship is causing to happen in our parishes, because people give to mission and vision, right? They don't give to crying and problems. 
And yet, in the most effective parishes, there's also a specific stewardship campaign month, and it does include personal contacts and interaction and an emphasis on engagement in ministries because we know the data shows that when people are engaged in the ministries of the parish, their generosity is substantially higher than when they're not. So the second building block that we look to assess within parishes is to learn more about and be able to give you an assessment on your stewardship campaign. Now, the third building block is the one of capital campaigns. So unlike your annual stewardship campaign, which basically focuses on achieving the annual needs that you have, as well as those that you need to help fund for, for some of your strategic goals, your capital campaign is critical because it's, it's what allows you to build the, the facilities, the infrastructure, the buildings, the, the iconography, whatever it is, the big assets, capital assets that you need to fulfill your mission. And so to kind of segue into some of the things that we're looking at on effective capital campaign. Uh, I want to call back in my, my uh, OMS colleague, Steve Tibbs, who, along with uh, Nick Chakos, leads some of our capital campaign efforts. Steve, tell us a little bit about what we look at in the capital campaign uh, building block of the pillar of stewardship and generosity. Steve, you're still with us or did we lose you? Sorry, I was on mute. Okay. Um, uh, capital campaigns are driven from the, uh, I'll say the, the interactive nature again, uh, between some of the pillars and blocks and the foundational element on a campaign is all about, have you created a culture of generosity uh, in the organization and trust in leadership? Uh, typically a capital campaign as Bill mentioned will be something that'll be very uh, noticeable physical, such as, you know, putting in a parking structure, building a new uh, education wing, uh, putting an iconography into the church, uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, but there are certain things that uh, we can look at from the building blocks. Uh, number one is, you know, is there a history of successful programs? Uh, if programs have failed previously, uh, why is that? Uh, if the parish has a history of, again, generosity and, and I hate to use the term successful, but it, in a campaign, it, it kind of applies to that. Yeah. Uh, is, the, is there credibility uh, for the campaign? Uh, one of the uh, other areas that parishes tussle with sometimes is do we try to do this on our own or should we bring in a fundraising expert? Uh, and so it, I would say my answer is, well, it depends, and it probably depends on the breadth and scope of the campaign. Uh, and sometimes the comfort of having maybe uncomfortable conversations, because guess what? One of the last things people like to do is ask people for money. And so <laughs> there are techniques and, and ways to train a team uh, to do that uh, and have some assistance. Uh, the next thing is a capital campaign doesn't just target big donors. Uh, right. If you're lucky enough that someone may come forward and underwrite an entire program, those are very few and very far between. But again, what we talked about in strategic planning is engagement and having everybody part of the process. And uh, one of the things that uh, will do that is giving everyone the opportunity is at the base of generosity, as Bill alluded to, is this recognition that all that we have is from God and for God. And if a parish does not know that, if they're not living that, then the ask becomes more difficult. And finally then, uh, you know, looking back at past campaigns, uh, an opportunity for parishioners to be involved, uh, was there communication, was there some, some of the good managerial practices. <clears throat> One of the things that, uh, that also is required is that it takes a little bit different leadership focus and, and management around a specific campaign than it would be on the ongoing parish management that a parish council might be involved with. Um, and it's also sometimes confusing real very quickly working with the parish one time said, we want to do a strategic plan. Okay. 
And as we talked about, I said, well, what would you like to accomplish? And they said, well, we'd like to repave the parking lot, fix the roof, and paint the outside of the building. <laughs> I paused and I said, well, that sounds like a capital campaign. Yeah. He said, yes, but we have to – Yes, but we have to approach it strategically. Well, okay. <laughs> You're right, but it's not a strategic plan. It's a capital campaign. And so uh, we looked at putting a very specific program together for that. And I think with this, so that's, that's, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I, I think that was no, a no. great, that's it. that was a great example. I think what this underscores is how these things all integrate and how they all come together. And, and that's the reason why in, in creating our effective parish assessment, what we realized is you, you can't just look at these things as an insular piece. You have to look them, you have to look at them one at a time, but then you have to aggregate it all together. And that's where taking these building blocks and building them into a pillar is, is really really, really relevant. And so the notion of a capital campaign is is so critical to parishes at any given point in time of their lives. And it's something that we have to look at at assessing at your parish to see how you're doing. And, and that's part of your ultimate grading of your effectiveness on stewardship and generosity. Now, the fourth building block is really plan giving and endowments. And, and I know this is um, interesting because they've done a survey and like I think it was 64% of people don't know what you're talking about when you use the phrase planned giving, right? And, and yet, in, 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 and in working with over 500 Orthodox parishes, so very, very few of them have planned giving programs that I'm not surprised. But if you think about it, what we're looking at is encouraging parishioners to, among other things, include the parish in their wills and estate plans. It also includes making sizable gifts outside of a capital campaign during their lives, but also, and very importantly, encouraging them to include your parish in their wills and estate plans. And to give you an order of magnitude of how critically important this is, I hope you're, hope you're paying attention still. There's empirical data that shows us baby boomers, those that were born between 1944 and 1964. So think of where you fit in that thing. If you're in the baby boomer, the baby boomers are going to transfer over the next several years years, $30 trillion, yes, that's trillion with a T, of net worth. $30 trillion is going to be transferred in the near future as some of us old timers pass to the kingdom eternal. And there's no reason why your parish should not benefit in some measure from this generosity. So when we talk about planned giving and when we're looking at assessing your parish's planned giving, we're looking at understanding the extent to which you have created a vehicle through which people can include their in their wills and estate plans your church and have been asked to do so because the data shows that the number one reason why donors make a major plan gift to any charity, doesn't matter if it's a church, a school or hospital, is solely because they were asked. Now, yes, they have to agree with the mission and the purpose and the credibility and the transparency and the trust, all the things that Steve and, and, and Mitch have mentioned already. But, but if you're not asking, chances are you're not going to get it. And, and, and just because people try to make excuses, the data also shows that 95% of most people's wealth is in stocks and property. And so when we talk about planned giving of those kinds of assets, that doesn't have any necessarily immediate impact on their cash flow or their lifestyle. So people of any income level can participate in a planned giving campaign. And there's even creative ways you can do it where you can buy a life insurance policy on yourself where the beneficiary is the church. But, but in addition to the $30 trillion worth of net worth that's going to be passed by the baby boomers in the, in the short period of time, what was fascinating from the research that has been done is that the typical planned gift, the typical amount that people will include in their will is often 200 times the size of their annual stewardship contribution. So just think about the order of magnitude of generosity that you can contribute and participate by having a planned giving campaign. And if you're looking for a very specific number in a recent survey that was done, what they found out is that the typical charitable bequest, now this isn't just to churches, it's to charities, in a will is $78,630. But 20% of wills have at least two such bequests. So let's just take the small amount, $78,630 is the annual bequest that people would put in their wills for charities. If you, just not to be 
uh, morbid about this, but if you think about all the parishioners who passed in the last year who may not have had the opportunity to give to the church and multiply that number times 78,000, you can start to see the order of magnitude of missed giving opportunity and generosity that you could help them with. And if you count the number of parishioners you have and multiply it by 78,000, well, I think you can start to see the order of magnitude. So one of the things that we look at and focus on is the degree to which the parish has a plan giving program and or what it can do to start it. And just as a quick aside, if you're interested in more information about plan giving, you can find a completed deck on that subject, a PowerPoint deck, for a program that we just did two weeks ago at the uh, GOA Archdiocesan uh, Clergy Lady Congress on plan giving. If you go to my website, stewardshipcalling.com, and go over to the stewardship tab and just hover over it, you'll drop down, and about fifth one down is plan giving, and you can actually see a program of how to create a plan giving program. But in the EPA, what we're assessing is your plan giving programs and opportunities for plan giving. So the fifth building block in the in the pillar of stewardship and generosity is external philanthropy. To what extent are your churches having an external focus on their generosity versus only an internal focus, meaning it's only benefiting themselves? And again, the research shows that parishes that have both an external focus as well as an internal focus will raise three to four, uh, three to four times as much money as churches that only have an internal focus. And it kind of makes sense because if your parish is effectively taking donations and putting them out into the world and causing them to multiply, as we learned in the parable of the talents, then all the data will prove that your stewards will trust you with more of the generosity of their charitable contributions. And and I know everybody's worried about, well, is that going up or is it going down? Well, the, the, there's actually Giving USA conducts an annual study of charitable giving in the United States. And what it showed, and you fasten your seatbelts, folks, if you don't believe me, you can go to the Giving USA website because they have a very empirical source that total charitable giving in 2021 grew 4% over the total of $466 billion that was contributed in 2020 in the United States alone. So we continue to see an increase in charitable giving and yet we're not seeing that same increase in giving to the churches because between 1990 and 2015, giving to churches dropped half, 50%, according to the latest research that was published by the New York Times. So generosity is socially contagious. There's all kinds of psychological studies that, that show that people that watched others making stingy donations became more stingy. And those, when they saw generosity practice, were more generous. And and they even showed, uh, one of the studies showed where a generous contribution by a participant ended up being tripled by the other participants over the course of the experiment, meaning that, that there can be a cascading effect of generosity through the culture that's built within the parish or within the organization. And so we look at the external philanthropy that your parish is practicing in the effective parish assessment as one of the building blocks. And then finally, just so I can wrap it up quickly for tonight, the sixth and final building block of the most effective parishes in the pillar of stewardship and generosity, what we look at is the ability, your transparency and accountability. And you'll see the transparency and accountability theme permeate multiple parts of the conversations that we've had. You heard it talked about when, when Steve and Mitch were talking about the teams aspect of it. You heard it spoken when we were talking about the vision and planning. So transparency and accountability is one of those themes that we see over and over again coming up in multiple of the pillars. But th there's a great book called Passing the Plate, why American Christians don't give away more money. And they had a quote in there that, that I thought was really fascinating on the point. And here's what they said, quote, a significant increase in the public transparency, accountability, and institutionalized credibility of many religious and charitable causes and organizations considerably increase the amount of money they receive. And, and, in, and in a subsequent book that did a study, their conclusion was that parishioners want more say in how their parishes are run in the parish financial matters. They expect accountability and transparency to be present. So, and, and frankly, this shouldn't surprise anybody. I mean, Holy Scripture in, in Titus 2, verses 7 and 8 says, and I quote, In everything, set them an example of doing what is good. 
in your teaching show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. And transparency and accountability and integrity become absolute expectations. They're kind of bare minimum standards, but we try to, through the effective parish assessment, look at and give you an evaluation of the degree to which your parish believes that there's transparency and accountability in what you're doing so that we can measure their feelings and give you feedback. So finally, just to kind of wrap this last segment up here, the the stewardship and generosity pillar that is so critically important as one of the six pillars is comprised of six building blocks. Your giving and tithing, your stewardship campaigns, your capital campaigns, your planned giving and endowments, your external philanthropy, and your transparency and accountability. And the OMS Effective Parish Assessment Program is uniquely designed to help you methodically assess how you're doing in that critical pillar in each of those critical building blocks. And as you're starting to hopefully see through what we've talked about today, each of these pillars are essential to the most effective and healthy parishes. And the building blocks, when aggregated together and optimized to excellence, will allow you to achieve excellence in that pillar and therefore receive the healthiest grade you possibly can as the most effective parish. Now, Y'all have been very patient, so that's, we're going to stop right here because, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, it's been a long night. But God willing, the entire Orthodox Ministry Services Parish team of Mitch Owen and Steve Tibbs and Nick Chekos and I will be back with you in just three days on Wednesday, August 3rd. And on that program, we're going to explore the three remaining pillars of the OMS Effective Parish Assessment Program, namely parishioner engagement, ministries, and operational effectiveness. So please tune in to the August 3rd Stewardship Calling First Wednesday program at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 Central, 6 Mountain, 5 Pacific, and you'll get, after which you'll have the entire vision of what the OMS Effective Parish Assessment Program is all about. And again, we encourage you to go to effectiveparish.org, and you can click on all the documents in there that lay it out, that have a nice, pretty pictures associated with, and they explain to you in the Orthodox um, uh, EPA page how you can give us your name and and the uh, parish information if you're interested in having the opportunity to participate in the free effective parish assessment once we're ready to roll it out on the new large platform. And if you're a GOA parish interested in participating in the program that Leadership 100 is helping sponsor, then you go to cohort parish at effectiveparish.org. So info at effectiveparish.org or cohort effectiveparish.org. So I want a big shout out thanks to the great Orthodox of uh, the Orthodox Ministry Services Effective Parish team here and 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 of course we you know we got Steve Tibbs and Mitch Owen and next next uh, few days we'll have Nick Chekos with us. Uh, also need a shout out of thanks to our assessment collaborator Dr. Scott Mondor and our marketing uh, guy and our and our back office guy Louis Lambrew and of course to Matushka Trudy Richter who's my show producer in Chesterton Indiana and the rest of the great team at Ancient Faith Radio. Um, if if you find any of these stewardship calling first Wednesday or fifth Sunday shows helpful or informative, tell your friends and tune in live, or you can listen to the archive podcast version within a couple of days of every one of these live programs. We reproduce this as a podcast version and you can find it by either going to ancient faith radio and the stewardship calling page and the appropriate date, which, you know, today's date is, is July 31st. Uh, or you can go to stewardshipcalling.com And I have a page uh, on the internet radio programs. And again, you go to the date of the program and you can find it. And if you're interested in any of the other resources that I have available on Stewardship Calling, you're welcome to them. They're all free. They're all available to you. And as we continue to build out the Effective Parish platform, you're going to see us porting in all of the answers to each of these various uh, pillars that we go on there. If you have any questions in the meantime and you just want to reach out to me, you can reach me at bill at stewardshipcalling.com and uh, let me know what your questions are and what you're thinking about. And as I always do, I ask you to remember that two of the most important days of your life are first, the day you were born, and second, the day you figure out why. And if you're not already living your stewardship calling, I hope that you will begin to prayerfully discern your why and your stewardship calling and start living the most extraordinary second part of your life. I hope you tune in with us on Wednesday, August 3rd for part two of this program. But in the meantime, I thank you for listening. God bless you. And as always, I pray that you S-O-T-P-A-E-T-J, which stands for Stay on the Path, capital T, capital P, and enjoy the journey. God bless and good night.